if I had my volume on, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, let me just make sure. Is Jason here? I haven't seen him, but he's, I, see him. I heard him earlier. I'm here. Okay. Yep, there he's here. Okay. Okay. here. Hello. All right. Um, let is. me do. I'll I'll do my perfunctory <laughs> announcements here, and then we'll hand things over to Jason. Uh, first of all, welcome to worship, um, especially if you're from away. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Uh, the music for the hymns is in the full bulletin, which is on the Faith at Home section of our website. The PowerPoint just has the lyrics because it's the font gets too small with the music. So if you want the music, um, it's on the website there. And then finally, just a reminder, this is uh, posted on Facebook after the service, and it's also um, live on YouTube. So this is like a uh, forum. So just uh, be mindful of our conversation. So, all right, that is all I have. Uh, Jason, whenever you're ready. Okay. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, our Maker and Redeemer, this is your world, and we are your people. Forgive us our sins and heal our divisions. We have, we have willfully misused your gifts of creation. We have seen the ill treatment of others and have not gone to their aid. We have condoned evil and dishonesty, failed to strive for justice. We have heard the good news of Christ, but have failed to share it with others. We have not loved you with our heart, nor our neighbors as our sins. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty creator and ever living God, we worship your glory, eternal three in one, and we praise your power, majestic one in three. Keep us steadfast in this faith, defend us in all adversity, and bring us at the last into your presence, where you live in endless joy and love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading today is Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. You whose glory is chanted above the heavens out of the mouths of infants and children. You have set up a fortress against your enemies to silence the foe and avenger. When I consider your heavens the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in their courses, what are mere mortals that you should be mindful of them, human beings that you should care for them? You have made them little less than divine, with glory and honor you crown them. You have made them rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. All flocks and cattle, even the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you. 
The Trinity is impossible to fully grasp. Reflecting on the mystery of the triune God, St. Augustine once suggested, if you understand God, you do not understand God. So, you know, why even bother? We could just wrap up now, go home. But that's not entirely satisfying. And the fact is people ask about the Trinity a lot, probably more than any other aspect of Christian doctrine. And thankfully, there's a simple answer, way to explain it. You can write it down on the back of your hand, and if someone asks you what the Trinity is all about, you can just rattle off this answer. And it's that God is one in essence, distinguished in three persons. So if you want to be avoid, avoid being labeled a heretic by the Synod office, that's the precise definition you want to use. One in essence, distinguished in three persons. But my, my own hunch is that when people ask questions about the Trinity, they're not asking about language and definitions and creeds. What they're really asking about is why the Trinity is so important. Why is something that is by definition impossible to understand also the characteristic feature of the Christian faith? And thankfully we have a better answer for that. It helps to remember here that the language of the Trinity is nowhere in scripture. Scripture uses the language of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the concept of the Trinity didn't become important until the second or third century, and it wasn't codified in some kind of creed until the fourth century. So if that language of Trinity, of one in essence, distinguished in three persons, is nowhere in scripture, then where did it come from? What's it trying to do? And why is it so important for us? Let's start by thinking about the one in essence. And let's think about this by trying to imagine what it was like to be a believer in the early church, say around the time St. Paul's letters were written, so 50 or 60 AD. And this is a community of people that's living through a time of unbelievable newness. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, combined with the sending of the Holy Spirit, means that God is doing something radically new in the world. There's no precedent for Jesus being raised from the dead. There's no historical analog for the gift of the Holy Spirit being poured out on all people. So they're in uncharted territory. But as the church experiences this radical newness, they realize something else, that the source and intention of all these actions is identical. That behind all that newness is the constant action of God. That the God of Israel, the one whom God called the Father, was poured out into this one human life. And that after his resurrection, the Son is still at work in the world through the Holy Spirit. So there's not a God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament, or a God of flesh and a God of spirit. There's just God. So the heart of the Trinitarian faith comes when these early believers realized that these injections of grace and mercy into history all have the same source. They all have the same character, or to use that doctrinal word, they all have the same essence. The kingdom of God that Jesus inaugurated is what God intended in the beginning. And the covenant community formed with the Israelites at Mount Sinai is what God intends for all creation to experience in the city of God. God is one. The upshot of this for us is that God is trustworthy. When God tells the Israelites they shouldn't kill, you don't have to think, yeah, but what would Jesus have to say about that? When Jesus says, blessed are the poor, you don't have to say, well, maybe the Holy Spirit thinks that the wealthy are blessed. There's a coherence to God's action. The sending of Jesus doesn't nullify or supersede the promises made to Israel. And the sending of the Holy Spirit doesn't make the historical life of Jesus irrelevant. When we say God is one, we're not just saying that God's one in theory. We're echoing the claim of the early church that God is consistent, faithful, and trustworthy. The second part of this is more fun. God is distinguished in three persons. So let's just pause here and think about what we mean by person. 
When we talk about what a person is, we usually mean distinct individuals. We have the myth of the self-made man who achieved greatness without any help or input from anybody else. When someone says, be your own person, they mean you should do what you want as a unique individual. When we talk about personal agency, personal responsibility, personal growth, personal is just a way of saying that it's all about you and it's very much not about other people. But when we say that God is three persons, we're implying something very different about what it means to be a person. That these persons have their identity, their action, their character wrapped up in one another, that they need each other. The father can't be the father without the son and the spirit. The son can't be the son without the father and the spirit. Spirit can't be the spirit without the father and the son. So you can never talk about one person of the Trinity without talking about the others. The fancy Greek word for this is perichoresis, which comes from the root word for dancing. If you're wondering why we just sang a hymn about the Trinity and dancing, that's why. And that image of perichoresis, we would just call it mutual dependence or mutual fulfillment. And when you think about this from the perspective of the early church, suddenly a whole bunch of new possibilities open up. And this is where it starts to get really fun. That mutual dependence, mutual indwelling that they ascribe to God is actually a reflection of their own experience. For the Gentiles, this is obviously true. Their salvation depends on a Jewish savior. So if you're a Gentile who cuts yourself off from the Jewish people and says, we don't have any use for Jews anymore, you're cutting yourself off from Jesus in the process. And it's also true for those Jewish believers in the early church. If you've ever read St. Paul's letters, you know there's all this stuff where he talks about this offering he's collecting. And we usually skip over it because it's just like, oh, we're passing the plates around. This sounds really boring. It's actually way more interesting than that. Because this is a collection taken up for the church in Jerusalem, which is majority Jewish. It's being funded by Gentiles. Gentiles, the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, have very mixed feelings about. So what you find in this experience of the early church is unity. And that unity is not just two groups of people that have been stuck together with duct tape, or two different groups of people that have the same denominational affiliation on paper. What you discover is two groups of people who find that their salvation, their welfare, their integrity is actually wrapped up in the salvation, welfare, and integrity of others. Who say, I can't flourish unless you flourish. I can't be free until you're free. And I can't have integrity unless you have integrity. If there's something that we need as a community, as a country, as a society, it's a more Trinitarian understanding of our person a sense that our welfare is wrapped up with one another's. One of the things this pandemic has made evident is the ways in which we depend on one another, that the boundaries between us and other people are more porous than we often realize. It's not a coincidence that our search for a new culture war has latched onto masks instead of say, hand washing. No one complains to the cart attendant at the grocery store that you don't want their cart sanitized with any of their stupid sanitizer. But people complain about having to wear masks all the time. And why is that? It's because you wash your hands to protect yourself, but you wear a mask mostly to protect other people. The integrity and safety of your own body depends on the action of other people. And this has always been true in a variety of ways, but now it's just much more apparent. It's literally in your face. Masks are a reminder of sickness and death, but they're also a reminder for us that we find salvation, wholeness, and feeling through depending on one another. And that's sort of what the doctrine of the Trinity is saying. That when we realize our mutual interdependence our knit togetherness, we're not realizing our weakness. 
we're beginning to participate in the divine life because we find our flourishing through God's gift of unity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to unmute yourself as we join the church around the world, confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Spirit of God, was crucified and died ascended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge by the end of the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life of the last. Amen. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of community, you form us as your church. Guide our bishops, pastors, deacons, and all the baptized in sharing your life-giving good news with all the world. Strengthen us to be bold in our proclamation. Hear us, O God. Your Hear mercy us. is great. God of creation, you called everything into being. Sustain this world with your renewing care. Inspire us to see waterways, plant life, birds, fish, insects, and mammals, and call them good. Hear us, O God. 
Your mercy is great. great. God of counsel, all authority belongs to you. Encourage the leaders of this and every land to seek peace, equality, and unity. Instill wisdom and advocates who work toward justice in ignored communities. We pray especially today for the people of Botswana and Zimbabwe. Hear us, O oh God. God of care, you created us in your image. Help us to see your likeness in one another. Open our eyes to see and attend to all who oppression and suffering. Console, heal, and nourish all in need. And if you have any intentions, you can offer those out loud or in your heart at this time. Carolyn. Ned, Nita, the family of Ed. Hear us, O oh God. Yes. Oh God, our builder, you have all the materials needed to construct our societies. We have all the strength to put wisdom on all that has fallen apart in our lives. You have the wisdom to reshape our world. Inspire us with all your wisdom, strength, and love to rebuild the broken walls in our community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With thanksgiving, we remember those who have died. Keep us in communion with all the saints until we at last find our rest in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We offer these prayers in the name of the one whose name is majestic in all the earth, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us, us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive, as we forgive those, those who trespass against, 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 against us. And lead us not, us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. evil. For thine, For thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the power, and the power, power, and glory, and glory, forever, forever and ever. And ever. Amen. Amen. Hips are switched. Are they switched? Yeah. Uh, Jason, what would you like to play? <laughs> What's that? Which 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 hymn do you want to do as the closing? Oh, I was gonna do uh, four fourteen. Yeah, that's great.
this time we open things up for announcements, joys, and concerns. Uh, any criticisms you could also air at this time. Um, I want to apologize. I mixed up one of the hymns in the bulletin today. So if you were confused, that was my mistake. Um, did anyone have anything they want to share with the congregation? No, I'm getting no one. Okay. Um, one thing I want to let you know um, is I just want to introduce to you a resource that you're going to have this summer. Um, this is a book that um, you're going to be getting a section of every week in the church e-blast, and I'm going to have some sort of I'm leaning some kind of podcast reflection that goes with it. Um, it's called Anxious to Talk About It, Helping White Christians Talk Faithfully About Racism. Um, one, one thing we're trying to avoid doing uh, given the killing of George Floyd, is just having a sort of one-off special service. Like, do you remember in the 90s, they had the special sitcom episode and it was like about drugs and then they just went back to like normal stuff. Um, we're gonna try to have a foundation for you. So when we come back in person, we can have um, some more work on anti-racism stuff. Um, this is important. Let me give you two reasons why. Um, if you remember, I think it was like the last Sunday we were together, Kimberly Vaughn was here from the New Jersey Senate office. Uh, she's a black woman who's uh, a assistant to the Bishop for hospitality. And she was talking about how she was going to all of these uh, ostensibly progressive, open-minded congregations. And people were just saying pretty outrageously insensitive stuff about race. Um, because they never talked about it because they thought they didn't need to. So it's a personal thing. Um, the other reason why I want you to be thinking about this, and we're going to work on some of these things together, is because we live in a community that's we were just looking at the demographics of our school. It's like 98, 99% white. Um, and we often talk about the church being a reflection of the kingdom of God. And so what do you do if your community doesn't look anything like the kingdom of God? What are your responsibilities? What are the things you need to be working on, being intentional about uh, fixing and doing together? So I'm hoping that this will be a, a conversation starter for you and kind of help you think about theology and your faith and racism. Um, and I think this will be a good resource for you. So I look forward to working through this together. There'll be more information in the email that goes out this week about um, exact you know, readings, podcasts, that all kind of stuff. But I hope this is useful to you. Excuse me. All right, and that's it uh, for announcements. So we'll go on to blessing and dismissal. All right. Can you advance the slide? There we go, perfect. I invite you to receive the blessing. May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. And may Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and share the good news. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.
like that postlude, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, fun. Anna. Thanks. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you, you too. You too. Stay safe. Everybody. Yeah, good. good to see. Good to see you all again. Yeah. Good morning to everyone. Good to be back. Can't see that audio. Probably not. I'm going to leave. Yeah, I know. Well, stay safe, everybody. Bye. Yeah. Bye, 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 everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, Max. Hey, Sally. Is she there? No, she's gone. Oh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go end the YouTube stream.